Hi, welcome to Galaxy Con Talks Comics. I am Mike Broder, and with me, as always, is my trusty sidekick, Patty Hawkins. Hello, hello. Good evening, Patty. Good evening, Mike. How are you doing this week? I'm, I'm swell, <laughs> as the kids say these days. Um, today, we welcome back uh, two pretty awesome people. We have uh, Peter David and Kathleen David. Hang on one second. Ah. Hi guys. Uh, Hi. Okay. I think that uh, you know you should you should need no introduction. And okay. uh, Kathleen, puppeteer extraordinaire. Yep. It's now my general title. That is your title, <laughs> Captain yeah. of Puppeteering. <laughs> How you know, are uh, you know, Kathleen and her puppeteering is in one of our most important uh, uh, GalaxyCon photos. Yeah, which one? Uh, the one with uh, me and Peter Capaldi. Yes, she's she's in the background. She's there, she's there with there with her Capaldi puppet and next to my mom. Yep, <laughs> who's a lovely person? <laughs> she thought the same of you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, for the, yeah, for those of you that may not know, whenever Peter shows one of our shows, Kathleen usually comes along. And Kathleen, being a puppet maker, an amazing puppet maker she is, uh, she will uh, bring and create a puppet for uh, a guest that she's she just wants to get away and presents it to them. And everybody is always gushing about these gifts. And uh, I'll try, we'll try to pull some images up for later on. But uh, her, her puppet making skills are to be noted. Thank you. I appreciate that. Always. Always. I love hearing the stories of when you present them to, especially the doctors, because, you know, we all love, we're all Doctor Who fans here. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's fun. I, today I, I actually, uh, I was going through some stuff and I found a business card and I flipped it over because business card, uh, it's Colin Baker's, which has it. <laughs> Certain information on it that I was like, I really have this. <laughs> I it what? Because because I know he he had he still always kept his day job of being a solicitor, I think, or something like that. He's yeah, uh, yeah. So is is it for like his legal services that he's like, oh, you can reach me here? Can't say. Okay, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> pal, so that's pretty that that's pretty awesome. That's very very awesome. Oh heck! Well, we're on. Well, I tell you what. Let's let's start off with this. Uh, Peter, you have a, a really good uh, David Tennant story, don't you? <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. Um, Kathleen had done a puppet of Tennant's doctor, and I was going to be attending a was Fourth it a one? Was it a wizard con? Yes, it was a wizard. Con. I was attending a wizard con that Tennant was going to be attending. <clears throat> Turn my fan on. Keep and I on. asked the wizard folks if they could arrange for me to bring the puppet straight to David Tennant because I didn't want to have to stand on what I anticipated would be a fairly long line. Um, and it turned out I was right. There were literally a thousand people online for him. That is no exaggeration. And they walked me toward, you know, when it was time, they walked me toward him and I'm carrying the puppet. And his handlers were kind of grouped in because they could see I wasn't going to be spending any money. So they wanted to minimize the amount of time I was interacting. And I walked up to him with the puppet and I said, my wife made this for you. And he was immediately enchanted by it. And he took it off the, uh, the, the rack and he started, started playing, playing with the puppet. It. Yeah. And I said, yes, my wife's name is Kathleen David. My name is Peter David. And he looked at me in surprise, and he said, Peter David, the writer for Marvel Comics? And I went, yes. And he said, I love your work on The Incredible Hulk. <laughs> and I turned to the thousand people online, and I said, David Tennant's a fan of mine. And everyone cheered. <laughs> and a couple of years later, I ran into Peter Dixon at a convention, and I said to him, you know, I think you might find it interesting that your son-in-law is a big fan of mine. And he looked at me like I was out of my mind. He said, he's a big fan of yours. He thought that I had misspoken. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, that's correct. He's a big fan of mine. And I told him who I was. And, of course, he didn't have the slightest idea because I am what I refer to as a VIP, a vaguely important person. <laughs> 
99.5% of people have no freaking clue who I am. And 0.5% gets really excited when they hear my name. And he, of course, was among the 99.5. But it was still entertaining to me that freaking David Tennant was a fan of my work. I'm always impressed when famous people are fans of my work. Um, I mean, there's no reason they shouldn't be, but nevertheless, it just kind of surprises me. Well, I think anybody who reads your stuff rapidly becomes a fan. And yeah, we've we've had Peter, uh, we've had uh, David on before, and it's I, some celebrities will say, "Oh, I'm a big fan of, of comics," and I feel like, yeah, they probably read some as a kid, but there's no doubt in my mind that Tenet is a hardcore fan. He's a nerd. <laughs> yeah, he's a nerd. No, that was I think that was that was Capaldi. Caroline chimed in about the fact that he wrote Doctor Who fan fiction, and I said, no, that was Capaldi. Yes. Capaldi wrote Doctor Who fan fiction? Yes. Before or after he became the Doctor? Way before, when he was a teenager. Oh, okay. He, he volunteered at age 14 to become the president of the Doctor Who fan club because it didn't, in the UK, because it didn't have one. Yep. It was like, I, I know I'm underage, but uh, I'm willing to do the job. <laughs> yeah, that's if that's yeah, if that's yeah, talk, yeah, talk about going full circle. <clears throat> yeah, really. Grew up, grew up being a fan of the doctor and and like Tenet and Cabaldi, they grew up being legitimate fans of the doctor and then became the doctor. Oh, absolutely. Not just on the show, not writing the show, not but this no, you became the doctor. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 won. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, I have some photos I'm going to share. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Patty, I sent you I sent you one from Dragon Con. Okay. <laughs> yep. Kath, are you are you in the picture? Yeah, you're standing right behind about- David. We worked this one out right before yeah. I snapped the photo. So that will you may not recognize them. Those are the puppets from Good, Good Omens. Omens. Yes. Uh, the one on the left is a tenant's character, and the one on the right is uh Oh, Mark Mar- no, Michael Michael Sheen's Michael character. Sheen's. That's the daughter Caroline off on the left. And that that was at that was at our Raleigh show last year. Right. Okay, looks yep. like. Mm-hmm. Let's see what else we got here. What else have we found? Oh, right. oh yeah, Carol, the late Carol Spinney. Yeah, great guy. And uh, that that's a Rumpelstiltskin puppet, right? Yeah, from uh, Once Upon a Time. Yeah. I have a Mr. Gold, too. Um, so I have both versions of him. Sometimes I have the puppets argue with themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, oh, hang on. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, back. Yeah, that's, God, that's, he's young. that's Neil and Little Neil. And I'll give you I'll give you a special one about that photograph, um, because Neil would always get himself photographed with you know the sunglasses on. It was like his yeah. shirt. That is the first picture of him taken by a fan, as it were, that um, he pulled the glasses up because the puppet could pull his glasses up, and he's like, "All right, let's matchy matchy." That that's really impressive, then. Because yeah, you're absolutely right, and 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 just in case our audience doesn't know, that's Neil Gaiman. Uh, he wrote a series called Sandman, that kind of you know one of the stalwarts of the it should be a series, all that fun stuff. Oh there, wow, there's Mr. Gold next to Rumple with his blankie, and uh, where was that taken? Backyard, um, on the oh yeah, okay, I know where it is, yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's the Doctor Strange puppet. That was the most insane build I think I ever did on a puppet because I tried to keep it as close as I could to the movie costume. Yeah. And breaking down the movie costume was... <clears throat> How did you make the eye of Agamotto? Uh, I did clay, and then I did paper mache over the clay, and then I put a Halloween light in the middle so it would glow. Um, 
I, I remember we had this conversation about this, and you were saying that the details of the cost of the movie costume were insane. Yeah, well, I lucked out. I would have not had been able to put those details in if they hadn't decided to film in New York right next to a comic book shop. Because the fan, because of course you see fans, they see Doctor Strange writing down, they snap a lot of photos, they put the photos up online going, gee, look where I was, and I'm going detail, detail, detail. As I recall, he went into a local comic store in full costume. Yeah, he went into a local comic store. In full costume. In full costume. Wow. Yeah, I picked up a copy of Doctor Strange, The Oath. There are, there, that's, that's not a bad one. And that is not a bad one at all. So, and then here's the uh, image. Oh, hang on, I gotta find that for you. Um, make Patty happy here. Oh, oh, that picture. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Holy cow! Yeah, on the uh, on the on the on the uh, right in the corner there, she's actually cosplaying as as his doctor. Oh. Uh, trying to. It's. Where is it, Patty? Uh, move over to the right to keep going past Capaldi's hand. Yeah. That was to the left. No. Yes, yeah, so I'm not quite. Yeah, good. on my screen. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, so to Cavaldi's left. The opposite side of, opposite side of, opposite side side of me. No, I'm right I'm right there. Are you you're off the you're off the picture? Yeah, you're off the, off the picture right now. Yeah, you're not, you're not in the picture. It's too right. low res. Okay. It's not uh it's not coming up. All right. But I got one other one. Ah, uh, ah, Sherlock and Watson. Yes, uh, 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 Kathleen and I are both great, uh, great aficionados of the Great Detective, and this was a panel we did, I think, at the last Mike's last Miami show two years ago. We just did, uh, we had a great panel. It was an examination of Sherlock Holmes, all the filmed versions, um, yeah. it's like the TV show versions, and and going all the way back to uh, you know like the the stage versions, and yeah. So she brought those in. We had fun. So and that's the uh, Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yes. that's the Jeremy Brett yes. Sherlock Holmes and uh, David Burke Watson. And uh, this is still on my Facebook page in the, my little favorite pictures section. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I had a lot of fun building those. The, the one thing that always just stymied me is I could never figure out what um, Jeremy Brett was doing. I couldn't figure out what the hell he was wearing around his neck. Mm. And uh, one of the dressers uh, for that television series said, it's a bow tie. He just tucked it in underneath. <clears throat> oh. It's just tucked under the collar. So yeah, the collar yeah. And the bow tie <clears throat> tucked underneath. Interesting. The scene, you know, I always think about the scene that fans said they want to see in an Avengers movie, a scene with uh, with Tony Stark and Doctor Strange and Martin Freeman's character, and yeah. one of them says something self-evident, and Martin Freeman's character says, no shit, Sherlock, and, and both Doctor Strange and Tony Stark exchange looks. Yeah. What did it no, they decided it was low hanging. There is low hanging fruit, and then there's stuff that's rotting on the ground and needs to stay there. Oh no, that's that that's great low hanging fruit, though. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I would have thrown that. If anything, I would have thrown that in as a as a bonus uh, jokes blooper reel scene or something yeah. like that. I mean, come on, that's that's if it's meta, then for me, I'm 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 tickled by it. But that's yeah. just me. No, I, I agree. Some of the meta, some of the meta stuff they've they that has has just shown up in all kinds of shows has just been. I mean, your punchline is better than mine. Mine would have been. I know you. I would. Oh wait, do we go to school together? Yeah, elementary. Ah. <laughs> oh god. You know, you could have done that with Cumberbatch and uh, Johnny Lee Miller. Johnny Lee Miller hasn't been in a Marvel movie though, has he? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting. Well, for 
I mean, they may have pulled and and uh, and uh, uh, Johnny Lynn Miller to both end up in Marvel films. Yeah, <laughs> like everybody else is. Every Helen single, Mirren. I want Helen Mirren in a in a Marvel film. Every single actor will eventually be in a Marvel film at this rate. Yeah, so. I I have no I have no problem with that. <laughs> That's the way too. So, uh, and going from Marvel over to DC, uh, Peter. What we, uh, one thing we said uh, we wanted to do when we brought you back was uh, we wanted to kind of talk. We we spent a lot of time in the '80s uh, stuff and the Hulk and Marvel okay. stuff, and uh, in the kind of early mid nineties, uh, you went to cross town over to DC, uh, and you started cracking over there. Um, yeah. let's, let's start with one, one thing I know is one of your pride and joy, the Atlantis Chronicles. Yes. Uh, that was the concept of Bob Greenberger's. He wanted to do a seven issue series about the history of Atlantis. And for reasons that I really am not sure of, he wanted me to write it. And I, at the time, this was in the, like was the 1980s, I think. Yep, it was these. I was really hooked on a major series that was running on PBS. There was a British series called I, Claudius. <laughs> that was, for those of you who have not seen it, is basically a story about uh, the line of uh, uh, Roman emperors beginning with uh, Augustus Caesar and running through to Nero, with the central figure being Tiberius Claudius Drusus Nero Germanicus, a stammerer played by um, Derek Jacobi. By Derek Derek Jacobi. Jacobi. And it was a terrific series, and I want to do my own version of I, Claudius, and that was my inspiration for how to handle the Atlantis Chronicles. I would have it cover generations, and I would have a series of narrators. I would have chroniclers. And I always thought that would be interesting the way that historians shape our perceptions of history. That to one historian, I mean, when you look at the historians of Claudius' time, some people painted him as a stammering moron, and the others painted him as a canny and wise emperor who hid behind his actual disabilities in order to stay alive, considering the way that uh, would-be emperors and various members of his family tended to, you know, die. And I decided to write a series of books in which we are seeing them told from the point of view of a series of historians. And as a result, their portrayals of various characters would shift from one to the next to the next. And that was how I composed the Atlantis Chronicles. Also, in I, wa I also was influenced by a book I'm sure you've heard of called The Princess Bride. Hmm. Now, for those who are <clears throat> unaware of its background and are only familiar with the movie, The Princess Bride, the book, has a fairly complex backstory. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, it was actually written by an, another author named S. Morgenstern, and that what the William Goldman version of the book is an abridged version, because S. Morgenstern supposedly wrote about all kinds of total nonsense, um, and Gold and and Goldman just basically decided to give us the good parts version, where he focused on the action and adventure and character interaction, and left out all of uh, Morgan Stern's complete digressions. And when I first started reading the book, I totally believed the backstory until I eventually caught on as I was reading the book. And I decided that I want to do that same thing with the Atlantis Chronicles. So what I did was, in the very first issue, I wrote a letter, a memo, that was ostensibly from Dick Giordano to Bob Greenberger. And in the memo, Dick talked about this uh, professor, um, a professor of uh, uh, R.K. Uh, R. K. Simpson. That's it, Professor R.K. Simpson that R.K. Simpson had discovered these books of actual Atlantean history, but he was unable to get anybody to publish it because everyone assumed that it was a scam, a hoax. Mm -hmm. 
and that he brought to your like, daughter. Like, like the Hitler diaries, if you remember exactly, that. Exactly right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think he mentioned the Hitler diaries. And Giordano wanted to adapt it because he didn't care if it was real or not. He just thought it was a really good story. And he listed for Bob in the memo a number of writers who he thought would be good to adapt it. And we listed about a dozen writers, none of them me. Hmm. And then there was a handwritten note on the memo from Bob that said, none of them available. How about Peter David? And there was a handwritten response from Dick that said, okay, if he's the best you can do. <laughs> now, the memo was written by me, but Dick's secretary typed it up on DC letterhead. Bob actually wrote in longhand the response, and Dick Giordano actually wrote in longhand the response to Bob. So that was all genuine. And we ran that in the back page of the first issue. And a girl came up to me at a convention after the book came out, and she said to me with 100% sincerity, I think it's terrible that Dick Giordano didn't mention you as being the perfect person to adapt Professor Simpson's books because you've obviously done a terrific job. And I thought, oh, my God, she bought it. And indeed, in subsequent issues, we ran articles about Atlantean history by Professor Simpson. Now, mm -hmm. I wrote them all, of course, <clears throat> and they came with various footnotes. And three out of the four footnotes, on average, would all be legitimate. And one of them referenced a book that did not exist. Now, that book that did not exist was always central to the core of the article. But I figured that if people found three of them did exist, it wouldn't occur to them that one was fabricated. This, of course, was before Google and Amazon, where sure. you could enter it and find that there's no such book. And indeed, it got so great that um, one day I got a call from a comic book retailer I've known for many years named Cliff Biggers. And Cliff said, mm. we've got, do you know Cliff? Uh, I had, I remember the little strip he used to run in the the comic yeah. shop uh, uh, giveaway. I forget what it was called. Comic shop news. Comic, comic shop news. news. Okay, yeah. Oh, he published comic shop news. Mm -hmm. And Cliff said, "We are have an argument going on here at the comic book store. Some people are sure that Professor Arkin <laughs> is real, and I'm telling him it's not. And I said, "No, they're right. He's real." And he said, "No, he's not." And I said, "Yeah, he is." And he said, fine, I want to interview him. I said, okay, when do you want him? When do you want to talk to him? And he gave me a time and date that he would call. I then called my brother-in-law, my then brother-in-law, Robert Kasman, Robert Simpson Kasman, who I named him after. Bobby was a, a rabbi. Is a rabbi. Is a rabbi and was very helpful when I was working out the religious aspects of Atlantis. Then I called Bobby and I said, hey, Bobby, want to be Professor Simpson in an interview? And Bobby <laughs> said, sure. So <laughs> at the point of day and time, Cliff's phone rings and he expects it's going to be me affecting a German accent or something like that. <laughs> and it's not. It's Bobby. And Cliff has no idea who this person is. He's never heard this voice. It's clearly not me. Who the hell is this? Now, he actually did some groundwork and prepared some fairly intelligent theological questions. But he was talking to a rabbi. So <laughs> Bobby was on top of everything. Sure. And said, That's absolutely true, although you're misquoting. What he actually said was this. And another guy said this in response to this. And he was giving these very educated responses. And after they were done, Cliff called me up and he said, who was that? And I said, that was Professor Simpson. <laughs> and he ran the interview and said, okay, I don't know who the hell this was, but it was not Peter David. So for want of a better explanation, ladies and gentlemen, Professor R.K. Simpson. And as a capper to the whole thing, we got their permission and we ran his interview 
with Professor Simpson in the last issue of the Atlantis Chronicles. We dropped his introduction about, I don't know who this was, but otherwise we just ran the actual interview. So it wound up circling back around. <laughs> you you guys basically cooked up a, a wrestling kayfabe angle. <clears throat> kayfabe. What? Kayfabe, sorry. You basically, uh, kayfabe, that's the, 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 that's the wrestling code for it's real, act like it's real, talk like it's real. Yeah, that's essentially what you guys did with this. My knowledge of wrestling doesn't extend much beyond Andy Kaufman, so <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Well, that that's essentially what you did, where you 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 put this precept out. No, no there's a fib it was, and you were all like, no, 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 this is this 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 is this is true. And I remember well, reading at the time, and I remember thinking, this seems so strange that DC would invest in this this somebody who who uh, some kook who says I got the secrets of Atlantis, and then reading it being all, wow, it dovetails really well into <laughs> what eventually we might know Aquaman to be, and and. But regardless of that fact, though, uh, yeah, I, I, and that's one of the things that really I, I really admired about the series was that you had you put in just really small tethers of what would eventually become modern Aquaman. It wasn't yeah. like okay, here's the royal bloodline, and his great 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 ancestor looks exactly like him, except maybe with a mustache or longer hair, and yeah. that's that's a that's a comic book trope I can't stand when the bloodlines are exactly alike and they just slightly look different from each other. Every person in Silver Age Superman's family history, they all looked alike. Yeah. And they were all the great explorers and adventures of Kryptonian history. And this was quite the opposite. And then the whole blonde hair thing implying that was a, that was a, a stigma. That was a sign of a cursed yeah. child. Exactly right. And I had, I had so much fun constructing this thing. And, I mean, there are weird things that happen as a result. For instance, in the first issue, I decided to go with the theory that a number of Atlantean scholars have that a meteor hit the Earth and caused Atlantis to sink. And I described the meteor getting closer and closer to Earth. And I was writing it full script because Esteban Morodo, the artist, didn't speak English and his daughter was translating it for him. Mm. And on page 20, I said, the meteor has drawn closer. We can now see its face, its surface and craggy exterior. And I, one day I get a call from Bob Greenberger and he says, we have a problem. I just got back page 20. When you said the face of the meteor, you meant the front, right? And I said, yeah, why? And they said, well, they literally translated it as face. The meteor has a face. And I went, what? And he sent me a picture of the meteor, and it was this death's head skull face <coughs> coming towards us. And he said, should I have art corrections fixed it? Fix it. And I looked at it, and I said, no, you know what? I like it. I mean, if you have a meteor coming toward you, and it's just a meteor, you can say to yourself, well, maybe we'll survive. If it's coming towards you and it has a death's head skull on it, that's it. Yeah. Now, do not start reading any continued stories. Get your affairs in order. Pack it up. Because if that thing has a death's head skull coming toward you, you're done. You know, the meteor is sending you a message. You will not survive. And indeed, two interesting things happened. Number one, I wound up, when I went on to write Aquaman, actually establishing why the meteor had a face. Mm. And number two, a couple of years ago, a photograph of a meteor was taken. That meteor was heading in Earth's direction. It didn't come anywhere near us. Yeah. But it had a death's head skull in it. And people were going... Oh, my God, Peter David predicted this in Atlantis Chronicles. No, I didn't. Esteban Morodo just drew it because he didn't understand what I said face. But nevertheless, I thought it was hilarious that there actually is a meteor out there with a death that skull in it. Uh, the infinite universe eventually will replicate art. Yeah. <laughs> so that was... That came out of way, and then... but. 
Wait, was the idea always that you would do this and then you thought, okay, uh, will I be able to write an Aquaman series after that? Or no. was, oh, so that was, because there was, there was a, a gap between that and yeah. when you actually got the book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wrote Atlantis Chronicles. And then um, they wanted me to do a four-issue Aquaman limited series that became Time and Tide. Mm -hmm. And I met with the editor. Oh, God, I'm forgetting who it was now, who the, my editor was. And he wanted to talk to me before he had me write the ongoing series. He was concerned because in the seventh issue of Atlantis Chronicles, we showed Aquaman's conception. And he was concerned that I was depicting it that Aquaman had been immaculately conceived, that I was portraying him as kind of like a Jesus figure. Hmm. And I said, oh, no, that was not an immaculate conception. Um, the wizard Atlan really did show up and have sex with his mother and conceive him in the normal way. I mean, he was wizard when he did it, but there was no yeah. immaculate conception. I'm Jewish. That didn't occur to me. <laughs> you know, it didn't occur to me to have turn Aquaman into a Christ-like figure, which then he was very relieved to hear because that, that took away his, his concerns about it. So, and was, they, this, uh, well, was this Kevin Dooley? Yeah, I think it was Kevin Dooley. Okay, yeah. And um, he then hired me to write the ongoing series. Um, they really liked what I'd done in the Aquaman Time and Tide, and they brought me on to write the ongoing series. And I then wound up using some of the characters and concepts that I had established in Atlantis Chronicles because, yep. you know, why not? It was there. It was already baked into the cake. And exactly. again, you know, with uh, is it because was his name Korak or Korak the the original blonde? Uh, uh, I want the, yeah. Um, I want to say Cordex, but I Cordex. Okay, yeah, the, the the Atlantean Antichrist, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't was... call him that, but yeah, wow. I think it was. I think it was Cordex. That sounds about right. Yeah, I could be wrong. wrong. I wrote it like 35, 20. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you were you were leading into that too. Um, early on, though, uh, you uh, you did make one pretty interesting change uh, to uh, uh, Aquaman. Um, kind of like you want yeah. to call it interesting. <laughs> When you had his hand bitten, uh, you chewed off by uh, by the piranhas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That was that was a tough sell. I wanted to, I wanted to do something that would make him more dramatic visually, and I came up with the notion of him having a harpoon on his hand. I thought that that would be good because a harpoon is a familiar weapon that humans use against sea creatures. Sure. So I thought it would be interesting to have him have a harpoon on him to use as a weapon against, you know, humans. Mm -hmm. And I had to sell the idea to Paul Levitz. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, going into a meeting in his office and describing the entire storyline that I was going to do. And eventually I was going to restore his hand to normal. But in the meantime, he was going to have the harpoon hand. Sure. And I thought it was really kind of interesting, the fan reactions to it, because... You know, I would say to people would say, when I was assigned to Aquaman, there was no interest from the fans. Aquaman was considered this boring character, which I didn't understand. I saw him as DC's equivalent of Tarzan. Mm -hmm. You know, he can go, he can go anywhere he can go anywhere he wants. He can survive in environments that would kill most people, and he can talk to animals. That's Tarzan. Yeah, true. You know, goes, oh, Tarzan's so lame. <clears throat> um, and I came up with the idea of the harpoon. And people would say to me, you know, in a bored tone of voice, okay, well, what are you going to be doing with Aquaman? And I'd say, well, we're going to be bringing Mira back. And they go, oh, okay, that's nice. And I said, and we're going to do a storyline that's going to raise Atlantis. And they go, oh, okay, that's fine. I said, oh, we're going to have his hand get eaten off by Piranha and replaced with the harpoon. And they went, <laughs> What? Wait, you're doing what? What's that? Wait, go back. What's happening? And I would tell them, I said, but he can control sea creatures. And I said, no, he can speak to sea creatures. You can't talk to Piranha. You know, only thing about his eat. You mm -hmm. can't convince Piranha to go away. Um, and, you know, 
it was interesting because, oh my God, fans objected to it and they hated it, but oh my God, did they buy the book? <laughs> oh. uh, it was, yeah, there was definitely a. I think a lot. I think a lot of your fans are carried over into it. Everybody was like, "Okay, if if Aquaman is ever going to be interesting, now's the time." Yeah. And well, the first it, thing I did was I let his beard grow out because why not? Yeah. There's not that many bearded heroes in the DC universe, mm -hmm. and I let his hair grow out because my attitude was, I was thinking about the Little Mermaid and how the Little Mermaid's hair was always moving whenever she was underwater. Sure. So I thought that would be a nice way to remind people that Aquaman is underwater. His hair would be floating around. Mm -hmm. And even if he's just standing and talking to people, it'll give the artist something interesting to do visually. Sure. And my attitude was, in the old days when Aquaman walks in, he's got short hair and he's clean shaven and he walks in and people go, oh, hey, I, Aquaman. Now he walks in, he's got long hair and a beard and a harpoon on his hand and people are going, Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Please don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is that people say Aquaman isn't as, isn't as good or powerful as Batman. And my attitude has always been, if you took Aquaman and dropped him with nothing but the clothes on his back into the worst part of Gotham City, he'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll head for the docks. If people encounter him along the way and try and rob him, he'll take him out. He's relatively bullet resistance. He can leap long distances. He's super strong. He'll make it to the docks and just swim away. If you took Bruce Wayne and dropped him with only the clothes on his back in the Marianas Trench, he's done. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Don't tell me that, that, that Bruce Wayne is such a badass because, I mean, unless he's got a can of bat shark repellent <laughs> with him, he's toast. Yeah, it's very true. There's, yeah, there's a. Uh... There's three things that really that really excited me about about your run on that, and still resonate today. It was so uh, one I liked your version of his origin uh, again, Tarzan esque being with the dolphins. Um, yeah. I liked that you weren't afraid to say if he's been raised around dolphins, then eventually he would become attracted to one. Hold on. Uh oh. Sarah. Sarah. Oh shit! That's my story. <laughs> Get it out of here. I'm getting it out of here. <laughs> well, okay. Patty, let me jump in. Sure. So, okay. you know, one of the cool things you did in the book was you brought back Dolphin. Yeah, oh. I brought her back for one reason and one reason only. I wanted to do a story called Single Wet Female. I don't know why. <laughs> but that was the main reason I brought Dolphin back. She was an underused character. Yeah. And I love the name for the story, so I had to bring her back. Yeah. I I she was one of those characters I didn't even know about her until I came across her in Who's Who. And I was like at that point I thought I'd known all the obscure one notes, but yeah, you pulled her out. No, that I, it was uh Jace did you ever meet Jay Scott Pike, Peter? I don't think so. Who's that? Jay Scott Pike is the guy who created Dolphin oh, in that okay. showcase at you. And he was a Forget about comics. He was a pinup artist in the in the fifties and sixties. Well, that explains a lot. I'm going to pull up some stuff. And so, I got in touch with him a couple of years ago before he passed away. Oh, he was living in Sarasota, so I was desperately trying to get him to come to our shows. Right. And uh, and it never it never worked out. Oh, but here, hang on. I'm gonna. But he was he was the, he was the nicest guy. And a really cool guy, but also a a, a real pinup artist. So here's here's the dolphin cover. Well, that's uh, right, yeah. Shopping, right, yeah, right. And then let me see what I can find here. Some other stuff that you might know yeah, from. That him. was like one of her few appearances before she showed up in Aquaman. Yes, I've never actually read that issue. <laughs> I should really try and find a copy of that. It's probably on the DC. It's a fun. It's a fun. It's a fun book. Um, you can probably find it on DC. Well, all those, all those DC Silver Age kind of showcase and and even House of Mystery before it became a horror title. I mean, those are just all fun. Which showcase issue was that? What number? I think it's seventy seven. Seventy seven. Okay. I'll ch I'll check on the. Uh, whoa. Hey. Hello. Okay. Oh, I know that style. 
right? So that's that, you know, but that's. That's what he was known for, right? Right, and, and he did a bunch of girls' romance comics for DC. I have a couple of pages of his girls' romance stuff nice. in the office. How um, did her panties fall down? <laughs> you know, these things happen, Patty, and I'd appreciate it if, you know. I just, uh, I'm a comic book fan. I want to know how things happen. I want to know who changes the tires on the Batmobile, damn it. Alfred. Alfred. <laughs> So See? if there's anything is if there's anything I accomplish today, it's getting people to know more about Jay. Okay. Because um, he was no. just such he was such a um um no, this is good style. Yeah. Hang on, here we come. I got I got a few more. So that's that's his art book. <clears throat> oh, wow. oh nice. And then uh <laughs> Here's another one. Mike is a big right. fan. Mike is a big fan of pinup artists, by the way. This is one of his areas of expertise. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, you know, 40s, 50s pinup okay. artist uh fan. And so the uh let me see if I can. Oh, there it is. Okay. So here he is with one. Of, I'm gonna bring up one of his paintings with him kind of towards the end of his life. Oh, oh wow. wow. And he uh, nice. so he you know just a really nice guy, really, you know, really, you know, was a was a was a you know fan of uh beautiful women. And uh and then here are the here's one of his girls' loves covers. I mean, I'm sure that modern day fans know Dolphin much more from my run of with her yes. Aquaman than yes. anything he did. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have uh, no idea. I wonder if you ever read any of my work with her. I don't know that he had read any comics later on in his in in life. So he did a lot of like girl like girls love stories that kind of thing. Okay, so that's one of his manhunt on wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I could play with fire and not be burned, but I was wrong. So he had shifted from comics, uh, from uh, from pinup work into comics in the in the sixties, right. and uh, and was doing you know some pinup stuff on the side. That's 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 good. That's a, that's a good clean style he's got. Yep. Yeah. That's very so, uh, twenty cents. Uh, yeah. So speaking of you, you brought in Dolphin into the thing to do a uh, single yep. female. Yep. <laughs> yeah and she uh, and uh i i thought it was interesting because because of that uh alex ross and uh and mark wade uh, integrated it in kingdom come because he's not married to mara in kingdom come he's married to dolphin really yeah it's 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 it's, it's understated but yes and they, they said in the liner notes later on that like no no that's not mara sitting on the throne with him that's dolphin I thought she wound up with Aqualad. Well, I can't. I think, I think in the Wild well, the in Kingdom Come being one of those possible futures they had and Got it. all that. Okay. Yeah, in, in between stuff. Yeah, it was all that stuff. But uh, and the other the other thing that I really enjoyed about your run on Aquaman was how you gave you gave the 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 you kind of defined what aquatic telepathy was as opposed to he's this is command them. You're right. He communicates with them and different types of fish and whatever have. Yeah, he could like the whales and dolphins. He could yeah. almost talk to exactly like a human, and the sharks were like, oh, okay. "Oh yeah, yeah no, sharks were food." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A, yeah, a lot of as Kathleen was just saying, a lot of people love my interpretation of food because rather than being as big of the sharks, rather than being these monsters, I had them. We would have the sharks swimming along, and the sharks are going. Food, 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 food. Hi, Aquaman. Food, food. Yeah. Food. You know, <laughs> yeah. They were not, they didn't give a damn about Aquaman at all, aside from, oh, it's Aquaman. Hi, how you doing? Um, they had the memory retention of goldfish. Yes. And all they cared about was food. I mean, I just played them the way that Richard Dreyfus's character described them in Jaws. They think about eating and making baby sharks, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so I didn't have them being particularly vicious as creatures. They were just kind of like the big dumbasses of the ocean. And fans loved it because most people's perceptions of sharks was formed by Jaws, which is an insanely inaccurate film. I mean, as has been advertised, a woman was just reported killed by a shark off the coast of Maine. And it's the first death by shark in a hundred years. Mm. But, you know, but Peter, the importance of Jaws, Jaws yeah. had something is much more important than what we learned about sharks. Okay. It's, it is the primer for how certain politicians yes, have, yes. have chosen to run the country. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, the whole state of Florida has now <laughs> turned into the town from, from Jaws. So I believe that... I believe like that, it, wouldn't you? Get your name in the National Geographic. Yeah. There might Mr. be some governors. <laughs> there might be some governors and, I don't know, maybe somebody a little bit higher up the food chain that, you know, uh, look at Jaws as the mayor in Jaws as a role model yes. on how to, how to make command decisions. That's absolutely true and depressingly accurate. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, uh, what was your what was your reaction uh, when you first saw uh, Momoa uh, rolled out as Oh, this is how Aquaman's going to look now. Oh, I loved it because Zack Snyder put up. The, oh, hold on, I have this here. I have uh, it's a reproduction of the necklace that Momoa wore. Oh, nice, nice. Um, Zack Snyder put up the picture of Momoa as Aquaman, and he said, "This is going to be Aquaman." And I love the reactions of the fans because it was split along age lines. That doesn't look anything like Aquaman. And the older fans said, no, that's Peter David's Aquaman. Which he got to tell. He got to tell which I actually got a chance to tell Jason when I met him at a convention. Yeah. Nice. Uh, very sweet guy. Yeah. Huge. I mean, the, he, dwarfs his, he dwarfs his body. Yeah. Guards. There was a picture that had Jason Momoa walking along with the bodyguards. And Momoa was about a head wider, head and a head taller, and a head wider yeah. than his guys. And it was like these boss guards. The, yeah, exactly. It was like these are the guys you have to fight past to get into the boss battle. Because if you can manage to fight your way past the guards, the boss is not going <laughs> to hand your head to you. A uh, very sweet guy, though. And uh, I was very pleased with the way that he, that he played Aquaman. Um, it was somewhat evocative of the way that I wrote the character. Indeed, yeah. a number of people went to see the movie and were disappointed he did not wind up with a harpoon on his hand at the end of the film. <laughs> well, I, I have been told that that might be a possibility for the sequel. If they ever get to make it. If they ever get to make it. Uh, we'll get there. Not as, not, as, not as soon as we want, but we'll get there. Absolutely. So, so well, yeah. They're, so they're looking, they're looking at um, on on that. I think they're looking at re like not rebooting, but kind of taking a more, we'll call it a jazz approach to the DC universe, and yes. jazz like kind of free flowing, like the yeah. Joker, the Joker movie can exist. Oh. You know, at the same time that a Christian Bale Batman movie can exist at the same time that a Robert Pattinson Batman movie can exist. So they're going with the whole alternate worlds thing, basically. Yes, yes. Whereas Marvel is very much, this is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yes. Everything is connected. Continuity is king. Yes. DC is now looking at perhaps, well, from what I've read, perhaps a more, you know, we're just going to tell the stories we want to tell. And if this is Earth 42, this is Earth 67, this is Earth 99, what yeah. does it matter? We're just going to tell a cool story. Well, they established that in their Crisis on Infinite Earth, Earth series. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's when they, and... had the, uh, <clears throat> they had the movie version of Flash show up and come face to face with the Grand Gustin Flash. And they've mm -hmm. been talking about having Michael Keaton in the new Flash movie yeah. as a Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Yep. Right? But I clearly... I'm down with that. I think that'd be yeah, great. Absolutely, but clearly that that Flash character was in yeah Justice League, where Ben Affleck was Batman. Yeah, but now you got Robert Pattinson. So how do you? It, yeah. it breaks me up that fans are totally receptive to the idea of Michael Keaton coming back as Bruce Wayne, considering that when it was originally announced that Michael Keaton was going to be playing Batman, 
fans were up in arms. Yeah, and but you you got to remember making out. But you got to remember when Michael Keaton got cast as Batman, he was Mr. Mom. Right. And but he, he was also, you know, I was at a convention. I've told this story, but I was at a convention. I was on a panel with several other guys. And it had just been announced that Tim Burton had cast Michael Keaton. And we were asked, what did we think of this casting? And the other guys on the panel said there was going to be an insult, that it was going to be the Adam West Batman again, there was going to be a big joke, and on and on. And I sat there and I said, you know, Michael Keaton is an actor. And Tim Burton is a director. And although they are primarily known for comedy, there is no reason to assume that they can't do a dramatic version of Batman. So I'm just going to wait and see the movie before I make a judgment on it. It is the only time I have ever been on a panel where I was booed by the audience. Wow. Even the guys oh. looked at me like I had just farted in synagogue or something. Now, flash forward several years to the same convention, and I'm walking around the hallway, and I hear a couple of fans talking. One of them said, have you heard they announced Batman Returns? And the other fan says, well, I'll tell you one thing. It better be Tim Burton and Michael Keaton, because otherwise it's going to suck. And I went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> you bastards. <laughs> so, to this day, fans are always so quick to come up with reasons to write off Actors in characters. I mean, absolutely. There were fans movies themselves. Out of yes, a part of a trailer. Yeah, I mean, fans wrote off uh, Robert Downey Jr. As, as Tony Stark. Um, pictures of Heath Ledger as the Joker taken backstage were circulated as proof that Heath Ledger was going to suck as the Joker. Oh yeah, he won the Oscar for it. I mean, you know, they are so quick to be judgmental and fans are always asking me about my opinions of movies mm -hmm. months before sometimes years before they come out and I always say I have no opinion until I actually see it smart because if you go into it with a clear mind you can have a much better time I mean you know I can go into it and find that I think <clears throat> it sucks but I actually have to see it first mm -hmm. I remember uh, when Keaton was announced. I wasn't in New York, but my best friend uh, was. And when he came back home for summer break, I think it was winter break, but uh, the movie Clean and Sober was <laughs> still out in theaters. Yep. So there were the subway ads and everything else. He said about, about every third subway ad of Clean and Sober, which was just Michael Keaton on the on the cover, like, like, like this, yeah. somebody had drawn a, a Batman mask over it just to see how he would look. And so apparently they, there was like oh, tons of them. Like every other, every oh, third yeah. subway stop, you'd you'd see like somebody had drawn a Batman mask on him. I, mean, I still remember when Opinion turned around. It was when the trailer, the first trailer hit. Yeah. The one that had no music, that just had scenes from the film. And they ran in front of, you know, word got out as to the movie it was going to be in front of. And people went to see the trailer. They then left before the movie started. They just went to see the trailer. And people came out of that trailer going, "Oh my God, that was awesome!" Well, do you remember the? Do you remember the 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 Prince music video? Oh yeah, that would have little clips from the movie. Yeah, and we were watching like we were watching the music video to get glimpses of what the movie was going to be because mm -hmm. it had stuff that wasn't in the trailer. Yeah, and, yeah. And, that trailer, I remember, started with the firing engine of the Batmobile as the Batmobile took off. Yep. And we're going, whoa, <laughs> that looks badass. And, you know, so that kind of like that engine was evocative of the TV show. But when the Batmobile comes rolling away, you're going, whoa, that is one hell of a vehicle. And, uh, you know, that, that scene where he grabs somebody and pull, and the guy goes, what are you? And he pulls him going and goes, I'm, I'm Batman. Batman. Um, you know, actually, that wasn't the original line. Originally, he said, I am the knight or something like that. And mm. Keith just changed it to, I'm Batman. And that, that just set the pattern for everybody else. And, you know, and I thought Keaton did a terrific job. 
it was phenomenal. But think about think about how where we were back then in '89, and I remember it clear as day. I mean, I was in high school. I was excited. I was excited for it, and I loved I loved Michael Keaton because I between Night Shift, which is still one of my fi- I love Night Shift with him and Henry Winkler. Every time I every time I talk to Winkler, I just talked about Night Shift. I think he's annoyed with me by now about it. Um, but I love Night Shift. I love Beetlejuice. You know, Mr. Mom. He was a great actor. That that movie Squeeze, the Squeeze that he did. Yeah. Um, but we hadn't had. A real superhero movie in years. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. The, there were, had been Superman with with Chris Reeves, yep. but sure. after sure. Superman two, Weedheart. It's but after Superman two, it gets goofy, right? Superman three, it's on the scale of goofy, and by Superman four, oh god, it, it's just ridiculous, right? Yeah. And you had had all the ca- you know canon stuff, you know the captain, the cheesy Captain America, yeah. You know, we hadn't had a real, I mean, uh, since Superman one two, yeah. what did we have? You know, movie wise or TV wise, where the superhero was treated with respect and intensity. Yeah, nothing. Quite the opposite, because I remember anything that came out, there'd always be an interview with somebody, and somebody would always say, "Of course, we're not making it too serious. After all, we're making a comic book movie." Yeah, exactly. Right. That line would always be some executive or somebody would say that, and I would, I would check out. Mm-hmm. And so you got, you've got years where there's nothing. Yep. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at a thing now. So before Batman, what? Uh, the Spirit, the '87 Spirit movie, the TV movie, TV movie, Sam Jones, yep. you know, Condor Man. Flash Gordon, Hero at Large. I always have. I'll have a. I have a soft spot for Condor Man and Hero at Large. Yeah, Condor Man was a good idea with bad execution because it was one of the first films that tried to do, um, tried to expand. You know, between merchandising and comic books and putting everything on on everything else. You know, it was Disney's really first attempt at creating a property that they could sell. You know, they wanted to do a TV series. They wanted to do all these other things. And Condor Man. Right. And then with DC, you go Superman in 78, Superman 2 in 80. Then you get that Swamp Thing movie in 82. God. Superman 3. Yeah. Supergirl. Superman 4. Return Return of Swamp Thing. Then Batman. Yeah, that's not a good yeah. track record. No. Nope. And then I, I will defend for the first Swamp Thing movie though. Marvel, you go from you got you got Howard the Duck in eighty six. Oh God, oh jeez. The Punisher in eighty nine. Well, like that Blade was in there, which, which really didn't even which really didn't come out. It was made in eighty nine, but it never yeah. came out for like years later. When did Blade come out? Blade came out in ninety nine. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was a while. So, so that Batman movie was we we I mean as a fan I remember being like, "Oh my god, they're going to make a superhero movie." And then they announced they announced Keaton who's a comedic actor, yeah. and they announced Tim Burton who hadn't done anything like that before. He'd done Beetlejuice, he'd done Right. But he wasn't, you know, a big director in in that realm. And so fans were I, I would say it's fair to, to be afraid because of what had come before. Well, what I can tell you is that the casting of Jack Nicholson as the Joker should have calmed everybody down because Nicholson's perfect. And I think that it helped. What I liked about that too is it's like they're giving they're giving the Joker to Jack Nicholson. I'm just going to be seeing Jack Nicholson. I'm never going to believe he's the Joker. <laughs> mm. no, no, Nicholson and, 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 the, and, and, and the other thing about this, and I said, because I'm not a huge fan of the 89 Batman movie. I'm I'm not. But the 89 Batman movie and its success is like the equivalent <laughs> of uh, the discovery of fire or the discovery of the invention oh, yeah. of the wheel in terms of geek culture and, and the, where we are all at in its strata. Because that showed that you could get audiences in to do it. That showed the studio that, yes, you can have a very... You have a semi-serious superhero movie that... You know that that is incredibly profitable, 
And if we had if we hadn't had that movie, we wouldn't have had Batman the animated series. If we hadn't had a Batman the animated on, series. Patty, yeah. If we hadn't had that movie, we wouldn't have had Batman Returns. Yes. <laughs> Which is I mean um, I want to comment a guy named Chief Running Mouth. Yes. Said, what about the supposed not Marvel non-compete clause or actors that are main characters in an MCU film? They aren't allowed to appear in a DCU. I don't know anything about that. I think that's not true. <clears throat> yeah, we've my, already seen. We've already seen that We're off the top of my head. I'm thinking now of it's possible Jameson. that the main characters, the Andrew Jake Garfield. Played J. Jonah Jameson, who's pretty much a main character in three Spider Man films. Then he played Commissioner Gordon in Justice League. Ryan and, Reynolds. And Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds, Green Lantern. Well, well, well the difference is, and, and the difference is, and where it doesn't apply here either, is Ryan Reynolds, that was a Fox movie. Yeah. And this J. Jonah Jameson is Sony, but also Michael Keaton was in the Sony Spider Man. So I don't think the so I don't think the Sony and Fox movies have any non competes. Now the, I don't think I don't think Marvel has a non compete at all. I uh, you know they're actors. You know I I, I mean yeah, I mean I don't think the throat of Robert Downey now, suddenly showed up and played Lex Luthor. Now now granted if I was an actor involved in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and my character was still alive, I might oh, hang on. consider hang on. declining. Hang on. So Chris Hemsworth said that he can't do any DC movies due to his non-compete. Okay. So, All right. so it seems that the leads, not not the supporting characters, but your Chris Evans, your Chris Hemsworth, can't do. Robert Downey Jr. probably couldn't do a DC movie during his tenure as Iron Man. Yeah, but Tony's dead. Right. Well, now he could probably do whatever he wants, but. And probably so could uh, Scarlett Johansson and Chris Evans and-, and Chris Evans. I think I think you have to remember that 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 Thor was early in the shooting match, so they may have had it early on, <clears throat> and then later went eh, not important. And besides which, he's continue. You know, Thor is going to be continuing to show up pretty regularly in Marvel right. Marvel yeah. movies. So if nothing else. <clears throat> Probably be too freaking busy. I mean, it's like I said. If I was an actor involved with them uh, as as a as a, mo- a moderate character, I, I would be a little leery of. Oh, it'd be nice to go to a DC film, but yeah, yeah. I mean, do I do I really want do I really want to uh, piss off the people that have got me this far? And also knowing that that part will go on and on. I mean, I remember talking to Clark Craig about um, Coulson. You know, and him, and he was, it, this was about the time that, that Colson was going to, Colson showed up um, after he was dead. And I said, how did that feel? And he said, well, they came to me and they said, okay, so in the next movie, and I went, whoa, whoa, the next movie? I'm dead. I said, eh. well, we haven't actually seen Colson in the movie. Right, but I can, so I'm looking at like the cast for the new Suicide Squad movie, mm-hmm. the DC movie, has Michael Rooker, but again his character's dead. Right. Idris Elba, you know his character's dead. Um, they've got uh, uh, Steve Aggie who is in Guard the first Guardians. Mm-hmm. They've got Taika Waititi, who's in the Thor movies. Okay. They've got Sean Gunn. Did Taika Waititi direct the Thor movies? Yeah, yeah, yeah but he's also in it. Yeah. Right, yeah. And then Sean Gunn's in it. So there are people who are, you know, secondary characters. Exactly. But the the a the a list guys, they're locked out. Weird. So that, Megan, that's showbiz. So Megan wants to know if space cases will ever be out. I very much doubt it. Nickelodeon doesn't seem to be remotely interested in releasing any of their live action movie of their live action TV series. I mean, huh. they're not being singled out. They have a full library of things that they have not released. They haven't released the Mystery Files of Shobi Wu. They haven't. Re- I don't believe they've released any number of Are You Afraid of the Dark or Keenan and Kel or any of their live action shows 
which really surprises the hell out of me because I think there's a huge market for it. But, I mean, they are all available on YouTube for what that's worth. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, they have no plans at all, which is annoying because I certainly remember enough about that series that I could sit there and do, uh, you know, audio commentary. Oh, that'd be nice. Entire episodes. I'm sure that Mumi would be happy to to uh, jump in as well. well then, you, know, you know what we should do? What? We should do a viewing party one day. Okay. Where we get you and Billy and we watch like the first episode. Okay. And you guys and people can watch along at home on uh, on YouTube and uh you know yeah. you guys, we could do a running commentary. <clears throat> we yeah. can bring, we can bring uh, Walter into that as well. Oh sure. Spencer wants to say hi. Hi, I see. Hi guys. Hi Spencer. Hey Spencer. Spencer, I got to call you later. <laughs> yeah, so, let's do that. Yeah, we should do that. Mm -hmm. Um I got to imagine CBS owns CBS owns space cases. Well, CBS owns Nickelodeon, I should say. Right. The Viacom, I right? Didn't know. I got to okay. imagine at some point in time it, it likely will end up on the on the it, CBS All Access. It has to do with the Canadian production. Ah. The problem is, is they went into bankruptcy, and there is no question as to who owns what and who owns what to begin with. So the yeah. In Canada, not down here in the United States. Yeah, it was produced yeah. by a Canadian production company called Sinar that was headed up by a woman who died while getting liposuction. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So I have absolutely no idea at this point who owns the rights to the TV series. Oh, man. Yeah, because it was a joint, since it was a joint production. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that, that that's like uh, when I asked uh, Vincent Price's daughter about her dad's cooking show. He had a cooking show on for about about two years. Really cool. Yeah, he had a cooking show, and I, and I asked her. I said, "Where is it?" And she shrugged and said, "Like we don't know. It's in it's some, some production company bought another production, bought another country. They have masters sitting in a vault. They don't know what they are, and nobody would be able to figure out who would own the rights. Because she... I would want to watch the hell out of that." Oh, same here. So yeah, it's it's yeah, right rights and all that navigation, especially when something like like, like poops out. Yeah, because nobody's interested in it unless some for some reason it it goes from zero to hero and it's a because a hot property yeah. and then the lawyers have to chew it out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, Mike. Uh, to the third, fourth season of the Muppet Show, Disney's still trying to work out the music rights. Yes. Oh, is that is that what the problem with that? Yes. Yeah, has been. <clears throat> That's also yeah. why we can't get WKRP on on um, Blu-ray or DVD. The and music, the greatest right. American hero. Hey. All, you know, all, they, all they put out Star Robin rights. For yeah, for those people who don't know Space Cases, what's interesting about it is that one of the characters in it is an engineering genius on a spaceship, played by Jewel State, age thirteen. You know, we kind of, I always say we reached through time and space and ripped off Joss Whedon <laughs> 10 years before Firefly. Yep. <laughs> so, so Jason Phillips says that we missed He Man. No, we didn't. I sure. promise you. He, when we were talking about superhero movies earlier, he said we missed He Man. No, we, we ignored He Man. Yeah, we, yeah, but Frank Langella just doing this. I will watch it for, for Langella because he just yeah. took the scenery and took large chunks of that and just he was having so much fun. So I actually had dinner with Skeletor. Oh, really? Uh, Alan Oppenheimer, a wonderful, talented actor. Wonderful oh, yes. man. We are, wonderful. we are, we are, we are friends with him, and yes, he's a, he's beloved around here. He was in a movie that I wrote called Transfers Four. Yes. And, uh, no, he was in four. And he, it was shot in Romania. There we go. <laughs> and I just literally happened to have this beside over here. Okay. Um, and he was in it. He was in like one or two scenes of it. And we went out to we went out to dinner at the hotel where we were all staying. And he was telling me that he had done the voice of Skeletor, and he also did the voice of Vanity Smurf. 
and he's sitting yeah. there talking like Skeletor and talking like a gay Smurf. You know, and I thought this is one of the more odd dinners of my life. <laughs> very, very sweet guy. Yeah. Oh. And, and one other thing in, in, in the, the He-Man movie's defense, these costumes were designed by Mobius. True. Okay. When well, it went well, in, and then well, it became a Burger King. Yeah. 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 Too. yeah. You know your picture of it? Um, it's, it? We're sorting out the artwork. It's in there somewhere. No, a Mobius, because we were just... We were I thought talking. it was up on the wall. No, I took it down. <laughs> um the uh yeah we ended up having having lunch with him nice uh, and he we were in france we were in france it was our it was around our anniversary and we we told him that and he drew me a beautiful picture of the silver <clears throat> nice i have an original piece of mobius art very cool you know i have no idea what it's worth and i ain't selling it anyway no, there oh know. i'm sure <laughs> Priceless, but yeah we're not selling it oh god spencer has a ridiculous fan question Really? What? <laughs> Could the maestro take out thickness if he was without the infinity gauntlet? <laughs> Are you kidding? The maestro would take Thanos out to dinner. <laughs> I want somebody to draw that now. I want somebody they would, to draw They would that. totally bond. Thanos yes. and the maestro out at a nice bistro, and the waiter's like... <laughs> Totally terrified. <laughs> so the maestro, the maestro, be all like, "I know you have your thing for death, but I have some girls who work for me that'll change your mind." So, Peter, so you brought up Transfers Four, okay? Um, so, for people that don't know, um, Transfer Series was uh, these direct-to-video movies from Full Moon Entertainment. Yeah. That the budgets. I think I spent more money on lunch today. <laughs> Then yeah. they spent on transfers for yeah, right? buck ninety seven was their budget basically. Mm -hmm. So how did you get involved with that? My then manager got me involved with it. Um, they had me do transfers four and five, and they had me do another film, another pair of films called Oblivion, which yes. was no relation to the Tom Cruise Oblivion. And it was basically about cowboys and aliens. And it was no relation to the eventual movie, Cowboys, cowboys and Aliens. aliens. Um, but it was it was a lot. Oblivion was a lot of fun. They actually spent a little money on that one. Um, all of this was filmed over in Romania, where everything is much, much cheaper. Um, Oblivion actually had a pretty good cast. We had George Takei, mm -hmm. um, Julie Newmar. Carl Striken, who you would know as Lurch from the two Adams, Adams family yeah. movies. Yep. Um, it was, you know, they were, and my father has a cameo in it. So he, nice. he's, uh, he's in the second Oblivion film. And which and was I, really Isaac, Hay Isaac Hayes is in it. Isaac yeah. Hayes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and actually, it's 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 kind of funny because my father actually came to this country to be in the movies. Which wow. he never managed to do, and I finally got him. Wow. He was so happy. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, I remember I was uh, reading your, uh, uh, but I digress, and uh, you talked about you know going through there and the traveling, and and you saw some pretty grim stuff over there. And we, I don't yeah. even want to go into that, but uh, no. yet that was that was a dual edged trip for you. I mean, you got yeah. the fun of watching the movie, but then you also saw. Things, not everything in Europe, especially yeah. Central Europe, were as rosy as we were led to believe after the fall of the communism. Yeah, I, I, it was interesting, though, because we were told explicitly, don't wear any clothing that marks you as Americans. Because you can run into trouble. And I'm walking around in the towns in Romania, and people are wearing sweatshirts and T-shirts that say Columbia University, Princeton. They're all freaking Romanian. Coca-Cola, they're all wearing these things that are have American connotations, and they're all speaking Romanian. They're all freaking Romanians, but they're dressing like Americans. So I thought that's interesting that the Americans should avoid dressing like Americans in Romania. Um, they are very proud people, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very proud of themselves that they overthrew, what, Ceausescu? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I had a guide with me, and he would be bringing me through the Bucharest. Yeah, 
I want to keep on say Budapest, Bucharest. Bucharest. Mm -hmm. And yeah. would say like, yes, that was Ceausescu's mansion before we threw him out. Oh, this is the place where his guards lived before we threw him out. I mean, wow. bringing up the fact that they threw out Ceausescu. Very, very proud folks. Nice. Very nice. And fun movies too, by the way. I, the Oblivion films, yeah, they're 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 yeah, they were they were fun for exactly what they were. And some of the transfer movies. I mean, I uh, I, I enjoyed the transfer movies a great deal. When I was. <clears throat> well, Transfers Four was okay. Transfers Five was a freaking disaster <laughs> because that had a budget of ninety seven cents. <laughs> I and told you, I spent more money on lunch today. <laughs> they told me when I wrote that script. This <clears throat> Please pause for a conference. Okay. Um, they told me, let your imagination run wild. And I went, okay. And I wrote this really great action film. And they had no budget to film any of the action sequences. So the actual movie for Transfers 5 was 65 minutes long. And that included a 10-minute recap from the previous film. They <laughs> dropped out oh my God. half an hour to 45 minutes of action sequences. I mean, God. the script I wrote was amazing. The script they filmed was just freaking boring. I mean, in order to describe it, I always say, imagine the first five minutes of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now imagine, no money for stuntmen. No money for caves, no money for reshoots, no money for props. If you shot the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark with a full moon budget, this is what it would be. Indiana Jones by himself creeping through a forest. He gets to a pedestal with the, with the statue sitting on top of the pedestal. He goes up to the pedestal, does this, does the switch, lets out a sigh of relief. Suddenly, the picture starts to shake, and you hear a vibration, and he runs off screen. The end. That's the first five minutes of Raiders under a phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that... <clears throat> We dealt with when we were making the Transfers movies. Like I said, Oblivion, they actually put some money into. Sure. Not a ton, but they easily spent like a million dollars on it. So that one. They're showing like, online that they spent 2.5 million on Oblivion. What? 2.5. Okay. 2.5 on IMDb. Um, that not might be for the two. That might be for Oblivion and Oblivion 2 together. That might be. Could be, yeah. Uh... Because they were filmed simultaneously. So, yeah, that was with the two of them together. So each film had about like a million and a quarter, which for Full Moon okay. and Romania was a lot. <clears throat> and, yes. in and in Oblivion, you threw in a lot of uh, in gags for co for comic book fans. Didn't was there? Yeah. Uh, there's the there's uh, the there's the, there's the uh, ma a throw a uh, uh, call out to man thing. Yes, um, what, what knows fear burns of the man things touch. Yes, that yes. <laughs> I will mention though that all the Star Trek puns were all George Takei. I believe it. I get blamed for them. Indeed, when he was throwing in these puns, I said, "You know, they're going to blame me for these, right?" And we actually then went to a screening that was held. I think it was the San Diego Comic Con. And George and I were sitting next to each other in the movie theater. And when he makes his first entrance, and his first line was, Jim. And he comes in with a bottle of Jim Beam. He says, Jim, beam me up. And the audience moaned. And I heard someone in the audience go, oh, Peter. And I turned to George and I said, I told you. I told you. Um, you know, I mean, I just, I just freaking knew it. So yeah, what? they blame me for that. Speaking, oh, Peter. Yeah. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of Star Star Trek puns, <clears throat> uh, Dreadstar. Ah. You, uh, you got a lot of Star Trek out in that. I did. 
So, uh, so you I, could- I actually was going to do a storyline that crossed over Dread Star and the Star Trek comic. Wow. Um, because I did a storyline in which I had the Dread Star characters running pastiches of Dread Star, of uh, the Star Trek characters. I then wound up doing the exact same story, but had it be told from the point of view of Dread Star, of the, of the Star Trek characters who ran into pastiches of Dread Star. And indeed, we even had it getting drawn. Uh, but I wound up quitting the book at that point because I just got fed up with it. And so that story never actually got published. We just had the first half of it in Dread Star. That's a shame. Yep. Mm. So um, so talk to us about that, Dread Star. So Starlin had worked on the book. Yes. And he's he's ready to kind of just, he's done enough. He's He's moving on. So yep. he reaches out to you and he's like, hey, you want to do this thing? That's exactly right. And then you 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 ran with it. Yeah. Um, That's how, right. So had you been reading the book prior to him? Oh, sure. Are you kidding? I was reading it since it began when it was being published by Epic because I was working for Marvel Comics at the time. Sure. Oh, so I had been invested in Dreadstar from the very beginning. I've been following it the whole time. So when Jim approached me about actually writing the series for First Comics, I was very excited and honored that he was interested in trusting me to uh, write it. So, and and it was a good run, except I think towards the end, First started to fall apart. That's exactly correct. And so that was, you know, you never got to wrap up the story. Not really, no. I mean, I didn't end it on a cliffhanger or anything. But I wasn't able to bring the series to any kind of a conclusion. Is there anything that you really wanted to do with that book that you didn't get to? Oh, Jesus, dude. I wrote it like 30 years ago. Huh. <laughs> you know what I did much <laughs> I didn't get it. I did wind up writing a four issue follow up series that was from Malibu. Malibu. Yeah. Yes. That, that picked up with Dreadstar's daughter. So that was entertaining. And then I was able to fill in some of the gaps on the series. But that was that was my last involvement with Dreadstar. I now understand that Jim is returning to the character, returning to the series. I have no idea if he's going to be using my version of Dreadstar or if he's just going to be going back to uh, his characters. But whatever he wants, it's his guy. I think it all happened. He's doing a he just did a Kickstarter, and I think it's all following what you did. I think it's all really your stuff's all Canonical. considered. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. we had we had him on. Uh, yeah, we had him on a few months a uh, few months ago. Yeah, it was like about a month and a half ago we first started doing this. So, <clears throat> and he was, yeah, he was full blaze ahead. Good. So, so all right, gentlemen, let's uh, let's call it a night. Okay. We've gone. Uh, we've got about an hour and a half out of this. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, so, uh, so Peter, so you got your Maestro comic coming out. Yes. Uh, what else you got coming out right now? Um, well, finally, um, the last issue of my uh, of my uh, Symbiote Spider Man is going to be coming out this week. I understand. Okay. And after that, and I'm already hard at work on the next series of Symbiote Spider Man. And Ooh, there's another one. Excellent. And we've just gotten approval for another Symbiote Spider-Man after that. So that should be entertaining. I'm actually thinking of setting that one in Las Vegas and bringing in Mr. Fix-It. Because, you know, what the hell? Why not? That would work. That would work. The time, the timing is about right. And and for people who don't know, your website is peterdavid.net. Correct. And you write, uh, I guess we'll call it blog posts pretty regularly I do, I do that and i also post on facebook i also yeah. post on twitter although usually just to make fun of donald trump right i was gonna say it's uh, it's not for the uh if you're if you're a fan of donald trump you might not want to uh to go to <laughs> peter's website it's not uh, yeah. for the faint of heart true and again uh neither is uh his presidency so uh oblivion is on the tubi app what is tubi Tubi is an app like a like a Hulu ish oh okay uh, type of thing. It's it's uh, 
It's an ad, it's a streaming service owned by Fox. Oh, okay. Well, apparently that's where Oblivion is. So right. you can get uh, you can get all your Oblivion fixes. Yep. All right, Peter. Tell tell Kathleen we said good night. I will. Patty. Mike, always a pleasure. Peter, well, always a pleasure indeed. We're gonna have to rewatch I Claudius. Yep. Well, I, it's funny because I actually made these notes in the beginning. Uh, I Claudius stars so many people who went oh, on to do so many geek related things. You had Patrick Stewart when he was yep. young enough to actually have hair, his no, own no, hair. It was a wig. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I actually, I actually saw. I, I went to. Um, uh, see uh, uh, the the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they had photographs of previous productions. They had pictures of Pica of Patrick Stewart in his twenties, and he was bald. Right. I mean, I don't know if the guy ever had hair. Might not have, but yeah, Patrick Stewart, John Rice Davies, uh, Rice Davies, Brian I'm Blessed, uh, Derek Jacoby, of course, my too. too. Uh, the lady yeah, John that played, Hurt. Peter said John Hurt. John, John Hurt, yeah. Uh, the lady Patricia that played... Quinn. Yes, but yeah, Pat Quinn. Uh, uh, the lady that played the evil mom, she was in John Clash of the Phillips. Titans. She, um, John Phillips. John Phillips, yeah. And John Phillips. Sean, yeah. The guy who played Tiberius played the, the first number two. Well, no, yeah, I thought he, was, he was Augustus. Yeah, the guy who played Tiberius was in the first episode of The Prisoner as the first number two. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't no, know. I, I take that back. There are two number twos in that one. He played the replacement. I have taken his place. I am the new number two. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's Derek Jacoby's Claudius, right? We've there got George go. Baker's Tiberius, John Hurt's Caligula. John Baker. Well, John Hurt's Caligula, Brian Blessed is Augustus. Yes. Patrick Stewart, Sejanus. Uh, Patricia Quinn was Livia. Uh, John Paul was Agrippa. John Reese Davies. John Reese Davies. Kevin McNally. It's a terrific cast. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. That's also on YouTube. It may also be on BritBox for all I know. I think, oh, I think I, you're better you're better you'll get better quality on BritBox. I yeah. remember I remember borrowing the VHS tapes from the library <laughs> to watch it in like the early nineties. No, I watched it when it was actually on the air. It was I was just so taken by that. <clears throat> Just so good. All right, Peter, we're going to say good night. Good night. Patty, let's take it away. Absolutely. Everyone will see you next week. Mm -hmm. I mean, All right. Uh, uh, st stick around for a second, Peter. We'll, we'll go backstage. Okay. Mm -hmm.